Well, it's good to be together, friends. Happy Easter still, because Jesus is still alive. I am so glad you're here today. My name's Ethan, one of the ministers here, and uh, we're continuing in this series, Back to Life. The principle is simple. Jesus is alive, wants you to be alive, and intends to bring you life. Uh, Just a little bit after the verse that Laurel read, it says, We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are meant to do great works. We've got got ministry to accomplish. God has a life for us. As we kicked off the series, we talked about a prayer discipline uh, that if you haven't tried it yet, I want to still recommend that I've heard some feedback from some people. It's been really meaningful. Just set aside a good chunk of time and just, just think through your life before God. And just say, every, God, every place, God, where I can just kind of stay on autopilot, I'll just stay on autopilot. That'd be great. But if there are places that need to change, if there are places where I need to make a move toward life, you just reveal that to me and make me make that clear. I've had some meetings the last couple of weeks with people that feel like they've just learned so much about God's direction from their life just by setting aside that time for prayer. And then last week, we, we talked about what it would look like to bring our relationships back to life. And we said to pull that off, we would need to take 1 Corinthians 13 and let that be our strategy for our relationships. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love keeps no record of wrongs. And just say, we're going to, however we function in all our relationships, we're going to pick from that list. Nothing more, nothing less. Just that list from 1 Corinthians 13. And then this week, I, I want to talk about another skill. A skill that's essential to getting back to life, to the life you want, to the life God wants for you, to, to the life you have dreamed about having. Because C- you know the life, right? I mean, you got a picture in your head of what the life looks like, you know? Uh, here, I, I'll, I'll tell you so. Here's what, my picture of what the life looks like. There's a sun shining. I didn't have a yellow marker, so we'll use orange. But there's a sun. Oh, well, you can't see that. Shoot. Um, all right, there's a sun shining. That's not right. Uh, Shoot. Um, uh, uh, That's a basketball. Anyways, there's a sun shining up in the sky. You get that? There's a sun shining. And then there's sort of a fence here. And um, and and it's got flowers. I brought pink for flowers. Bless it. You can't see that either. Anyways, it's got flowers down here. And you can see the flowers. And they're pretty. And then there's there's like a a house. Does that work? Um, No. Blast it. And there's a door. Anyway, you get the idea. Or you can picture. You can picture. You, you, you've got a picture. You don't need my picture. Right? Uh, the, the point is this. Forget the drawing. The point is this. We know the life that we want. Right? Or at least we have a sense. We have a sense that there is a life out there that we could want or would want. And then in contrast to the life we want, there's the life we have. Ooh, let's pretend that's what I was drawing. Yeah, that's what I was drawing. I was drawing the life we have. And there's a gap. There's a gap between the life you want and the life you have. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know? It might be a professional gap. There's the job you want and the job you have. Or the job you deserved and the job you have, or the job you earned, or the job you once had, and the job you had today. Maybe there's a relational gap. The relationships you wanted, or the quality of relationships you had, or the the number of relationships you had, and, and the relationships that you've got. Maybe it's a personal gap. Maybe the gap you're most aware of is the gap between who you wanted to be and who you are. I could make a list of things that if you'd asked me when I was 20, I would tell you I will never be. I've got a list. Half of them I am today. There's a gap between who I wanted to be, who I thought I would be, who I know I should be, who God wants me to be, and who I am. Maybe the gap you're, you're locked into is a gap about your past. Like, you're, you, this is what should have happened, and instead, this is what did happen. 
or that's a gap about your present. This is where I should be. This is what should be happening. This is who I should be, and this is where I am. Or maybe it's a gap about your future. You're like, I, I was going to go there, and now I see it's impossible. There's even a gap between the drawing I wanted and the drawing I drew. And the Bible has a name for this gap. Uh, the name for this gap in Scripture is sin. Uh, I don't know how you feel about sin, but, but that's the name the Bible gives to this gap. Uh, sin is an English word, obviously, that's translating a Greek word. The Greek word is hamartia, and it means to miss the mark. It just means it's the, it's the word for the gap between the target and where you landed. And the Bible's super clear that our lives miss the mark for all kinds of reasons. You know, sometimes our lives miss the mark just because the world is broken, right? Maybe the big gap you see right now is the life I wanted, I didn't have cancer. And in the life I've got, I've got cancer, and that's a gap. But that's not your fault. That's just the fallenness and brokenness of the world. Maybe sometimes that's the gap. Or maybe the, the big gaps you see are about what others have done. If they hadn't done that, if they had kept their promises, if they had been a faithful friend, if they had been an effective parent, if they had been an honorable and trusting spouse, well, then this gap between the life I have and the life I wanted wouldn't be here. Hamartia, sin, talks about that. But of course, you know, some of the gap is because of what I've done and you've done. If I hadn't done that, I'd be here instead of here. If I hadn't made that choice, I'd be this person instead of this person, you know. And for a lot of us, the gap right now is bigger than it was two years ago. The gap right now, none of us would have said, yeah, in the life I dream about, I'm wearing masks all the time. No, that's a gap. Between the life we've got and the life we've wanted. But even two years ago, we were missing the mark. When somebody says, I'm a sinner, all, they, all, they're, all they're saying is, I miss the mark. In my life, I miss the mark. The, the target that I wanted for my life, the target that God wanted for my life is different than the target I hit. And even two years ago, we were missing the mark. There is a gap for everybody at every time. And this is why what we've been saying for the last few weeks is it's not enough to go back to normal. None of us want to go back to normal because the gap was there. And it isn't enough to just rely on our own strength. I, I have got no plan for how to fix that drawing. I lack the markers. Two of my three markers are dead. And I lack the skill. Here's how the Bible describes the reality of the gap. What shall we conclude then? Is there anybody with an advantage? <laughs> Not at all. For we've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of, the, of sin, the power of the gap, the power of the mark missing, the target missing. There is no one righteous not even one. There's nobody who has it figured out. There's no one who understands, he goes on to write. There's no one who seeks God. Verse 12, all have turned away. They have become altogether worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace, they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know. Whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, 
so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. That is the reality of the gap. Everybody, Paul says, is under the weight of the gap. The distance between the life they were meant to live, the life they were called to live, and the life they actually live. And Paul says God's law, God's way for our life, its main function is just to clarify the target so we can see the gap. It doesn't actually, the law by itself does not help us hit the target. It just clarifies the target so we know, oh wow, I really really miss the target. And again, I want to be clear, I know the gaps in your life are for all sorts of reasons. Some of them are somebody else's fault. And some of them are the world's fault. And some of them are your fault. But the gap's there, Paul says, for everybody, all the time. Nobody has an advantage in this contest. There's nobody who's kind of up, who's winning this game. And how we respond to the gap, of course, varies a lot. Uh, some of us, just you know, by, by personality or by upbringing, we obsess about the gap. And maybe you're here today, and, and I'm, I'm even worried right now that I'm just feeding into your sense of guilt, that you just obsess about the gap. You've got a sense of victimhood. You're, you're, you're maybe, maybe the gap that other people caused in your life, or guilt, the gap that you caused in your life. Some people respond to the gap by ignoring the gap. They deny that sin even exists. They deny that there even is a target, you know? They stick the arrow in the ground and then draw circles around it. I, I could pretend that was the drawing. I, I, that's what I want my life to look like. That's what I think. I think the sun actually does look like a crossed out basketball, you know? That's what I actually think the sun looks like. You know? they, they just deny that there even is a target problem. But the gap doesn't get any less real just because you pretend it's not there. And over time... The gap weighs us down. It might start out little at first, but over time, the distance between the life God created you for and the life you actually live, it begins begins to be heavy. The wages of sin increase and the weight becomes unbearable and soon we can't even live the life we're living, much less living the life we were made for. I was 13 or 14 uh, hiking with my scout troop I uh, did spend a lot, a lot of time on the trail with my scout troop, and one night, or one trip, it was a three-day, two-night trip, and um, on the first day, there was this one kid who just spent the whole time bragging about how much stronger he was and how faster he was. He was running off in the head, and the scout masters were calling him back, and we were super annoyed. And so the next morning, as we were loading up and packing up, a couple guys put a few rocks in the bottom of his pack. And then every so often as we hiked along, if you were behind him, you'd just pick up a rock and tuck it in a pocket. And of course, you know, the jostle of the pack, he didn't feel it. Or if we stopped for a break, somebody would take some big rocks and put them in the top and kind of pack them in where he wouldn't notice. Little by little, so he never noticed that the pack was getting heavier and heavier. And pretty soon he wasn't the fastest in the troop. Not long after that, he was in the back of the line, huffing and puffing, barely making it. And we were delighted. Uh, We stopped for lunch, of course, and he just, in exhaustion, just threw his pack off and rocks spilled out from every nook and cranny, every little pocket and place, and we were seriously busted. Our scoutmaster did not think it nearly as funny as we did. Um, I still actually think it's a little bit funny. I probably shouldn't, but I still do. Um, But I remember that story because that's sometimes what happens to people who are weighed down by the gap, you know? Sometimes when somebody's already weighed down by the gap, other people show up to pile on the rocks, to to point out their mistakes, to pile on the shame, to pile on the guilt, to make clear what they failed, to make it clear that they missed the mark, and it just gets heavier and heavier. And sometimes even the church does that, and when the church does that, that's the church at its worst. Sometimes when somebody becomes aware of the weight of the gap in their life, somebody, does, uh, somebody come, comes along, shows up to preach despair. 
There are a lot of people preaching despair in our world right now. And sometimes despair sounds like what we think it sounds like. It's traditional despair. It's hopeless. Just give up, it sounds like. In fact, maybe you thought if you heard that thing from Romans chapter 3 that Paul is about to preach despair. There's no one righteous. Just give up. Maybe that's where you think he's going. But I've heard recently another kind of despair emerge that I want to warn you about. When people see somebody weighed down by the gap, weighed down by the the mark mist of their life, weighed down by the sin of their life, I've heard a new version of despair I want to warn you about. It's It's the despair that sounds like this. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. You're good. You're good. Just the way you are. Everything's fine. That, that's, a per, that's a beautiful drawing, Ethan. It's, it's gorgeous, you know? And, and the reason we adopt this strategy is, of course, because we're, we're trying not to do the judgment and shame strategy where you pile on the rocks, okay? And that's a good impulse, but it's a bad strategy to go to somebody who's weighed down, crushed by the weight of their sin, and tell them, oh, you're fine. That's the way your life is supposed to work. That's the way your relationships are supposed to, yeah, you're supposed to be angry all the time. You're supposed to, you're not, there's no problem here. You're supposed to leave a wake of destruction and dysfunction behind you. There's there's nothing wrong here. You're good. You're perfect just the way you are. That does someone no good. That is just as despairing as the person who says you're hopeless. Give up now. What we want is to be healed for the life we want, not to be told that our sickness is, is fine, just to stay that way. Because sin is real. The gap is real. The weight we are carrying will crush us if left unchecked. And in my defense, sometimes we were not jerks. My, my scout troop, this is, that I'm thinking about. I have another memory from about a year later. New guy, just joined the cr- troop. A uh, scrawny little kid named Steve. Uh, never gone overnight hiking before, and so he had borrowed a pack from an adult friend. Great big backpack, practically taller than he was. And he had packed way too much stuff. I mean, clearly his mom had helped him pack like they were spending a week at the beach. Canned food, all kinds of stuff. That pack was so crazy heavy. One of the scoutmasters had to pick it up and put it on his back. He staggered like a drunk man the first step he took. So we could immediately see that he was in trouble. We, we stopped for a break, probably not even 200 yards up the trail, because this kid was dying. And the first thing he did after he stepped down his pack was one of the older scouts went over and reached in the top and took out a 24-ounce can of peaches, <laughs> put it in his pack, and we hiked on a little bit. He made it maybe 150 yards farther. We stopped again, and this time we just said, all right, open your bag. And we just started passing out canned food to the whole troop. Everybody got two or three cans. We stopped again at lunch, and he was still really struggling. So we were like, okay, open your bag again. The most amazing thing to me was down at the bottom of his pack, he had a Coleman camping stove. Not a backpacking stove, but a camping stove. That thing must have weighed 15 pounds. I have no clue what sucker had to carry that for the next two days, but somebody got that. By the time we were done, he had the lightest pack in the troop. Because people saw the weight, and they said, let me help you carry it. So I guess the thing I want want you to think about is, what does God do when God sees us weighed down by the weight of our sin? And again, I know some people struggle with this word, sin. Sin is just the name for the gap between the life you have and the life you were meant to live. There's the sin of the world which affects us. There's the sin of others which affects us. There's our own sin that affects us. All the ways that we fall short of God's good intention for our life. And 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 what I want you to just think about for a second is, what do you think God does when God sees somebody weighed down by sin? Does God pile on the rocks? Watch them crumple under the weight? Or does God say, hand me your pack? I'll carry what you can't. Some people think God piles on the shame. 
I know that people, their whole conception of God is that God is there to kind of widen the gap and broaden the gap, that, that somehow God gave us God's law to increase the burden of our sin. But God's law does not increase the burden of our sin. It merely clarifies the reality of our sin so that we can have it dealt with. This is what God does. Paul goes on after he makes it clear that everybody's got a gap. He says this, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short. See that? That's the gap. We fall short of the glory of God. And, he says, all are justified. To be justified means to be made to stand in the right place. It's you fall short and God comes along and just picks you up and puts you where you're supposed to be. All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Atonement means to repair a broken relationship. A sacrifice divine to repair a broken relationship through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. That's how God responds to the gap. God leaves the sins unpunished and fills the gap with Jesus Christ. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as at the same time to be just, to be that means to be the one who is in the right and to be the one who justifies. That means the one who puts you in the right for those who have faith in Jesus. That is what God is like. God sees a life that doesn't hit the mark. And God says, oh, let's just have a do-over. Let's just start clean. Let's just leave all of this unpunished. I wish God could go back and talk to my art teacher. If we could just leave all of Ethan's drawings unpunished, that'd be awesome. God says, I will cancel the debt. I will pay the price. I will forgive your sin. I will finish the race. I will complete the gap. Whatever distance remains between the life you live and the life you were intended to live, I will fill that distance so that you will live the life I made you for. And it doesn't matter the reason. Maybe the gap is because of the corruption and evil of our world. God says, I've overcome the world. Maybe the gap is because of the cruelty of others who have abused you and victimized you. And God says, I will make you my child and protect you from your enemies. And maybe the gap is you. And some of the gap is, and you wonder about the character of God. And you wonder, what will God do when God realizes that a lot of it is my fault? What will God do? The psalmist knew what God would do. Listen to Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, pay attention to my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits And in his word, I put my hope. That is who your God is. And maybe you wonder, like I get this, I wonder this sometimes too. You wonder, is there some other way? Like maybe, could I repay the debt? Could I fill the gap? Could I fix what was broken? Could I finish the race that was set before me? Could I accomplish, could I kind of seize and accomplish the life I was meant to live? And I get the question, because I sure would like to do it on my own too, but basically the answer is no, you can't. I mean, for lots of reasons, in part because the, the gap is just too big. 
The damage is too severe. And some of it wasn't even your fault. You can't control what other people do. Only God can do that. So much of the problem is beyond your control. You know, you can't end cancer. You can't end fallenness. But the other reason that you can't do it on your own, and it only can be accomplished by the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ, is this. Most of the debts we owe to God, most of the gap, is the kind of thing that can't be paid back. It can't be made up. It can only be forgiven, you know, or it can crush us. That's it. You know, when I was faithless and dishonored God with my behavior, I can't go back in time and behave differently. The, the damage is done. The, the, the damage to God's reputation in the world is already there. Either that debt will crush me or God will forgive it, but I can't go back and close the gap. And this is why God wants so much for you to trust in Jesus Christ. This is why churches put energy into telling other people about Jesus. It's not because we feel judgmental toward them. It's not because we want to pile on the rocks and make their pack heavier. It's because your life and my life and everyone's life can only be made whole through the forgiveness that God grants. There's just no other way given to us to close the gap. All that is accomplished through the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf can only be accomplished by Jesus Christ on behalf, on your behalf. God loves you and God wants more than you want the life God wants for you. God wants the life God wants for you. And that can only be happened if the gap is closed between where you've wound up and where God wanted to take you. And that happens when God forgives your sin and sets you free from the weight of bondage and allows you to live again. This is why we say in Christ alone there is salvation because there is no other name in heaven or on earth that can close the gap and forgive your sin and set you once again on the right path. If you want to be brought back to life, not just back to normal, but back to life, you need to be forgiven as an ongoing undergirding reality of your life. I want to take two minutes and I want to tell you about a corollary to this and I'm going to come back to where I just was. It's also true that if you want to come back to life, you need to be forgiving. I just want to let you know and I wish this wasn't the case. I wish there was some other solution to this but I want you to know that that in the same way that the debt you owe to God for your sin is a debt that can never be repaid, it can only be forgiven, that's true of most of the ways people have done you wrong too. You know, all of us have relationships that are broken because of our sin, but we also have relationships that are broken because of somebody else's sin. They did us wrong, they let us down, they lied about us, whatever it is. And, and here's the thing, Relational debts like that can't be paid back. Now, they could go and tell the truth. I'm not saying they can't repent. They can change. But they still can't un... You can't unthrow a punch that was once thrown. You can't unsay a cruel word that was once said. You can't unlet somebody down that you once let down. Right? You can't unlose your temper when you lost your temper. Which means debts like that cannot be paid back. They can only be forgiven. This is why Paul writes, bear with one another. And if someone has a complaint against the other, uh, just listen, if someone has a complaint against the other, and, and I sort of expect Paul to say, well then stick it to them for all they're worth. Get, your, get, get it back. But he doesn't say that. 
He says, let them off the hook. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. And I just want to tell you, some of you right now today have a broken relationship that you would like to see healed. And you are waiting for someone to repay a debt that they can never repay. Even if they wanted to, they couldn't pay it back. And the only way, the only way forward is going to be for you to just say, I forgive you. You don't have to pay back the debt. You know, we could talk more about what, you know, that repentance is part of this and new patterns of life are part of this. I'm not saying stay in a place, relationship where you're getting abused. But I'm saying if you're waiting for them to pay something back they can't pay back, well, you'll wait a long time. Some of you have a broken relationship with yourself for the same reason. You let yourself down. Maybe you let yourself down in one big act of foolishness. Or maybe you let yourself down systematically over decades. And you're so mad at yourself and you won't forgive yourself. And I just want to tell you, you can't pay yourself back. That's that's an unpayable debt. God is ready to forgive you. Maybe you should be ready to forgive yourself. Because the Bible is just super clear that all of us who have been forgiven by God, listen to this, all of us who have been forgiven by God are expected to share that same kind of forgiveness with others. But if you want to be a forgiving person, it starts by being a forgiven person. And when you pretend there is no gap, God cannot forgive you. What is there to forgive? When you pretend everything's fine, there's no sin to look at here, what is God supposed to do? When you pretend that you know how to fix the gap and you don't need God's help, God cannot forgive you. For you have said that's your responsibility, not God's. But when you are honest with God that the gap is real, And that you can't close it on your own. That there's a difference between the life you do live and the life you wish you lived. The life you should live. The life God calls you to live. And that difference is a name. Hamartia. Missing the mark. In English, sin. When you're honest with God that it's there and it's real and you can't close the gap. And the results of your sin are making the life you live not the life you want to live. And making the lives of those around you not the lives that you wish they could live and God wishes they could live. When you do that, God is faithful and just to forgive. That's what God does. And Jesus says, come to me. Everybody who's weary and heavy laden, crushed by the gap. And he says, I'll give you rest. And if you want that, if you want God to close the gap, to pick you up and place you in the right place, to forgive your sin, pay back the debt, and set you on the path to life, if you want God to unburden your life and forgive everything that you've done wrong, if you want God to protect you from your enemies and protect you from the fallenness of the world, you might wonder, well, what do I do? How do, how do I get, out, get into that? That sounds pretty good. Well, Peter was once asked that question, and he said this, brothers and sisters, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that invitation has not changed. Still today, if you want God to pay back your debts and set you on the right path and close the gap, we respond the same way. We repent to turn from our own way to God's. We're baptized into Christ. We receive forgiveness of sins and new life in the Holy Spirit. And I just want to say, if that's a decision you've already made, then today, would you just go back to God? I'm going to pray in just a second. Would you just pray with me? Would you just go back to God and say, God, I still depend on you to close the gap. I still depend on your forgiveness in my life. 
And if that's a decision you've never made, I just want you to know I think you should. God is desperately waiting for you to accept his opportunity to forgiveness. God loves you so much, and God hates the way that you are weighed down by your own sin and the sin and brokenness of our world. And God wants to lighten your load. And I would just pray that you would do that. We're going to sing some songs here. Uh, first, about the way we should be loving to others. Because be, we are forgiven, so we should be forgiving. And then we're going to talk about Christ and the salvation he offers. And if you need to take a step of baptism today, or you just want to talk to somebody about, I want to be forgiven. I want my debts paid. And I'll be up front. You can come talk to me while we sing. Let's pray. Gracious God, we wish the gap wasn't real. And sometimes we pretend it isn't. And we wish we could close it on our own. And sometimes we pretend we can. But only you, God, can give us a fresh start. Only you, God, can pick us up from where we are and place us where we were meant to be. Only you, God can accomplish for us what we could never accomplish on our own. And so now we come to you in prayer, God. We come to you and we just say, Lord, forgive us our sins. And teach us to forgive the sins of others. And if there are people who need today to respond in baptism, I just really pray that you give them the confidence to come down here and talk to me as we sing together. We offer you our whole lives, trusting in the salvation that comes through Christ alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.